found that this type of format is really useful because it allows you to really understand uh, perhaps biases, but also other arguments about certain topics. And so uh, I'm very happy that uh, uh, Lisa Maria Pombo Gonzalez from Tijuana, Mexico is going to chair this session. I'll hand it over to Lisa. Hi. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, it's a pleasure to with you uh, continuing the metabolic session. Uh, the experts forum is, is called the operation of choice in morbidly obesity type 2 diabetic patients is and the moderators are going to be Professor Bruno Villemans, Professor Francesco Rubino. If I can invite you to pass here in the front please. Christine Renfieldy, Tarek Mari, Ali Alrandi, Aurum Sigurdsson, Alfred Selleck, Francisco Campo from Mexico, and Michelle Gagne from Canada, and also Rosario Bellini. Thank you very much. And I take the prerogative of being the moderator of your uh, music uh, to uh, frame the question a bit more precisely. So I think we'll see more blind between uh, the experts here because otherwise this is a quite broad uh, question. So let's look at a patient how they usually show to us. So it comes to our clinic. Uh, it's a patient who has a BMI of 37, uh, type 2 diabetes for the past uh, 10 years. Uh, the patient is on insulin and on three different drugs, and the A1C levels are 8.7. So, poorly controlled diabetes, multiple drugs, including insulin. Uh, the patient has a uh, um, moderate reflux and uh, a previous uh, gynecological operation, uh, nothing uh, major. What would you, the patient comes to your clinic because it's concerned about his type 2 diabetes. It's not coming to you because it would be it's a male patient, by the way, which is another important thing. So the patient never showed up before for obesity regulations because the, as all many patients don't think obesity is a problem, but it's now as well as papers that diabetes will be treated surgically. What is your advice? Which procedure would you recommend? I'm not sure you this one. Next first. Okay. Next first. Okay, I'll take that. Okay, so, uh, <laughs> um, so of course, the literature will support that with those statistics, the gastric bypass has uh, the, the best scientific data to support it being the best operation for this patient. But what this patient will say is, oh, no, 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 I'm not going to have something that invasive. I will not have gastric bypass. And so the question is, what else do you have to offer? In that BMI uh, zone, that patient is not thinking surgery, and I would have no difficulty uh, offering a, a lap band or gastric band to that patient. With the caveat that the patient needs to uh, have a follow-up and do all the behavioral changes. Um, and we have data on this. I, I know we, we had a, a lovely talk this morning about the uh, type 2 diabetics and all the literature, but it was one of the papers that, that was not reported and, and referenced was our five-year uh, lap band paper of 95 patients, with BMI between 35 and, 30, and 45. Uh, they went from a BMI average of down by 10 points, and at five years, 40% had uh, normal HbA1c's off medication, and 40% had improvement of their HbA1c on less medication. <laughs> So there is a role for lack of gastric banding in the patient who's motivated and in the program that's going to take care of this patient. So those would be my two operations I would offer. Oh, thank you. Uh, well, in, in our case in Mexico City, we have a, a, a plan established with these patients. I think that in, in this uh, patient specialty, we do um, sleep gastrectomy because I've, uh, in our experience in this kind of patients, uh, it has been a very, a very good uh, surgery with, with very good results for us. And I think that's all I have. Well, if you read uh, Professor Rubino's paper in Lancet, 
a five-year result resolution of type 2 diabetes is 63% with BPD versus 37% with gastric bypass. So it all depends if you believe that morbid obesity and type 2 diabetes is a chronic disease. If it's a chronic disease and you're looking at treating someone for 30 or 40 years, then you better have a plan of incremental, just like treating diabetes with drugs, you know, you start with diet and then you go with one drug and then I see a second and a third and after that I might see uh, insulin and there might be different types of insulin and I think we should see, start to think about surgery in incremental steps. So, doing a BPD these days, who does a BPD these days? Nobody. Nobody except the one who talks a lot. So, and, and he's even retired from surgery, so actually nobody does this operation. And I think it's more the second generation, which is the classic BPDDS. And even, you can ask yourself, is anybody now still doing the classic BPDDS? Because we have a third generation of procedures, like uh, SADI, SASI, SAGI, you know, SAGI. Yeah, and so, and so uh, I am more inclined now to treat type 2 diabetes in incremental steps. So I would prefer to do a sleeve first and see if this patient has a good response. Might be taken off insulin, might go to one drug, perhaps. And if this is a good candidate for an intestinal surgery later on, I would have spoken to this patient from the first day that there is a possibility that you may need intestinal surgery later on. And we've got these choices now that are coming on uh, that are very appealing and uh, closer to resolution of diabetes that is going to be, well, in, in a very strict definition at 63%, but in other papers is anywhere between 85 to nearly 100%, depending on the stage of the disease of, of that diabetes. So, so that's what I would... Uh, and, and I think my answers to all the different kind of patients is going to be very similar. Um, we are routinely doing a mixed meal tolerance test to all type 2 diabetes in our clinic. Uh, almost 95% of patients who are coming to us are non morbid obese diabetics, and we have operated more than 4,000 cases within the last 10 years. Uh, during the first five years, we have done sleeves, we have done bypasses, and in the second five years, we have devised them. So, we have switched our approach to talk to diabetics, and we have always looked for an option of bringing the ileum to the proximal part of the digestive system without causing a significant malabsorption. And what we are doing is an interposition and ileal interposition, but this is a complex surgery. I cannot advise to all the clinics doing this, but for the sleeve and for the bypass, I'm sorry to say that, now we are routinely devising them. So devising the cases that we have done during the first five years of our experience. We pass it for failure to lose weight or diabetes control? Diabetes control as well as weight. Thank you. Uh, I, uh, as, a, as a rather, rather uh, simple surgeon, I need a clever operation. And I will go uh, exclude uh, barotus esophagus and go for the sleeve on the basis that the weight loss is the same as the liver and diagnostic bypass. And uh, the diabetes resolution is the same in long term. Uh, as the as the liver and bypass, and uh, you have the option to convert to a, a hypoabsorptive operation, being it SASI, uh, SASI, or whatever you call them, or the classical TS. And I think that is the main uh, thing to, to look uh, after this patient long term. And uh, it is more difficult, significantly more difficult, to revise the liver and bypass than the. And I'm speaking gentlemen. That's my approach. Yes, I think uh, first we must discuss with the patient what is the aim of surgery we need for weight loss or for diabetes. This is the first uh, uh, point of discussion. 
Second point, we look first for uh, how many years uh, diabetes is it 10 years, the age 37, and uh, we look for CP type also because we, we must get the mission, the aim of surgery to resolution or just the mission of diabetes. Second step, usually it's eat, uh, in this patient, it's 37 and they have three type of drugs in spite of 10 years uh, the duration of diabetes. I think this is uh, not sufficient for this patient. We need more powerful operation than uh, sleep. If you, our, our aiming, uh, if you, especially the sleep type is uh, high, and the aiming is uh, uh, resolution, not remission of diabetes. For us, we uh, start since uh, four years for uh, MGB, but now then we change to bypass patient, to SASI bypass. We, we find a sleep is a good operation for the patient for uh, duration of diabetes, one year, two years, uh, but if more than 10 years, and uh, in spite of three drugs, we need to add it earlier, uh, anesthesis, SASI sleep earlier uh, by bus, saying uh, anesthesis sleep earlier by bus, uh, I think it is more powerful than sleep sleep to me in this patient. But if the patient has just one year or two years, in spite of the sleep type is good, at this age, the sleep is sufficient for me. Thank you. Uh, we offer all the four types of surgery in, um, in, uh, in my institute. So we offer band, sleep, bypass, and the bypass. We offer all the four options. And, and our choice for choosing which operation best for that patient actually is a combination between the patient's own eating habits. Yeah. For example, if the patient's main sweet eaters, uh, then I would be inclined not to give them the sleeve. Because, you know, the sleeve is, uh, I don't think the sleeve is the best option for people who are sweet eaters. Um, and for the patient, for example, who are large volume eaters, then I will be more inclined to sleep. Uh, for so this is one. The second factor is patient comorbidity. So patients, for example, get multiple double operations, and obviously the, 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 the sound surgery is a bit difficult to offer. Patients with um, arterial bowel syndrome, inflammatory bowel disease, sorry, like a celiac or um, um, osteoporosis or Crohn's, then so obviously I, I tend to go away from uh, such uh, sound operations. Um, and, uh, and also, also consider the patient which is of course a patient who doesn't want a sleeve or bypass or whatever he wants. So uh, we'll, we'll set a patient who is, who is diabetic or, and who would like to, uh, who is a sweet eater maybe, that would like inclined to give them a mini bypass. And the, adva the advantage of it is well, actually it's combined the two, the, the advantage of the sleeve, because you have a long sleeve there, and also the advantage of having the best part of the bypass which is the long period of that's what Okay, in, I think that the key points in the case that uh, Professor Robin outlined is the reflux. So in my unit, uh, the answer until now would be if a patient has a reflux, you should perform uh, a gastric bypass. But after the lectures that uh, were presented today with the correction, with the procedures uh, and the data that comes up from the literature, I think that sleep uh, can be an option uh, and should be proposed to the patient. Uh, and what I like uh, it, that is uh, an open procedure, so we can then forward switch for a SADI, a SASI, or uh, even go for a bypass. But uh, uh, I think that this kind of uh, monetary item, if there is reflux, then you should perform a bypass, should be a bypass. So uh, maybe in this patient, the reflux, which your client is moderate, is mild, should be, of course. Uh, you know, treated or investigated a bit, but uh, I would not speak on indication reflux bypass, uh, uh, especially after these uh, uh, lectures today. So I'll try to summarize and maybe provoke uh, some of you to give a um, rebuttal. So, first of all, I made a mistake. I said that the patient had a uh, it was a male patient, but had a gynecological operation before the assessment. <laughs> Some of you might be puzzled about that. Right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, there was a reason why I say male patients is because uh, um, they tend to be uh, to come to surgery more later than women, as you know, when it comes to bariatric surgery, their diabetes is very often more severe, etc., etc. Anyway, so it, it sounds like. Uh, there was some recognition that there is medical evidence in support, perhaps, of gastrobacterium <coughs> more effective uh, on average. Uh, I 
I think in that particular respect of this patient, it would be the operation that would reduce uh, medication usage more likely than others. Perhaps not so much as much as the uh, BPD, but certainly more than fantasy. But I want to uh, comment on two points and have your uh, rebuttal on that. So um, many of you have probably agreed with Dr. Gagnier that sleepless could be an option for this particular patient. And I think one of the reasons was because it is allows incremental um, um, therapy over time. Uh, it would be um, in theory um, in theory safer than gastrovascular vaccine um, for some of the complications. But the question is, uh, would be incremental? So if you plan to increment medical therapy is one thing. Uh, to implement surgical therapy is an entirely different story. You have to go back and operate the risks are completely different uh, down the road, etc. Acceptability from uh, payers is going to be very uh, problematic because I don't think payers are really going to pay for one operation and doubt that they're going to play, pay uh, or, or even be interested to listen to us if we say we want to do two operations sometime. Uh, so you have to do the best operation you have to do. There is another um, assumption you make when you say incremental therapies is that you could go back 10 years later and do an operation and still uh, hope that it has an efficacy where we know that the longer the patients have been diabetic, the much less the efficacy uh, of surgery, any surgery whatsoever, including BPD, is going to be. So if you do a, the long operation at the first time, uh, you're not going to have a rescue later on. So this incremental concept is something that I think we should um, uh, revise. And also, because it's diabetes, uh, and it's talking about millions and millions of patients, we have to come out of our niche as bariatric surgeons. Uh, we have been operating on 0.1% of the population, perhaps the rest, with the disease. If we want to play a different game, and we want to say now we want to operate with many more patients, then I think we have to start reasoning almost like uh, doctors reason when they have to offer pharmaceutical interventions, which by definition they are giving to many more patients. You cannot afford the same level of um, uh, failure and saying, well, they'll get another op operation um, if you scale it up to millions and millions of patients. So I'm very concerned about this in in incremental. It sounds like a reasonable and logical concept, but it's very practical when it comes to surgical patients. Well, <clears throat> you look at bypass, you know, there are more recent papers publishing like Adams and uh, others from Virginia at 10 years, 12 years, the bypass resolution of type 2 diabetes is no more than 50%. So what are you going to do with the 50% that don't have their diabetes treated? Because one of the most difficult things that I have in my practice is to revise the gastric bypass. Because I don't know what to do. I've tried all the different uh, algorithms and I'm disappointed by any of them actually, except perhaps from transformation of bypass to DS, and that's a big transformation. I would rather not do that, not wanting or have to do that. And so, um, sleep gastrectomy, you do this for diabetic, you know pretty soon if you've had resolution or not. It doesn't, it, you know, it doesn't take five to 10 years to know the answer. So that if you have to do an intestinal surgery, it's pretty short from the uh, sleeve gastrectomy, maybe two or three years. And we know from the University of Nice that if you do a switch in one step or two steps, uh, the the answer or the resolution of type 2 diabetes or the weight loss is exactly the same. So I don't think you have lost the window to do a, a incremental <coughs> surgery for type 2 diabetes. And I think instead of getting 50% resolution of type 2 diabetes of 10 years, that algorithm is going to bring you more closer to 85, 90%. Maybe perhaps the, you know. So, uh, Professor Rubino, why don't you believe your own data in Lancet that you find <laughs> <laughs> So I completely agree with the incremental uh, approach. Treatment model for a chronic disease because the first line option will only affect maybe 25, most 50 patients, 50 percent of patients. And so I'm actually confused by why we're choosing the more invasive sleeve when we have still available in the entire universe, the entire world is a gastric band. It's still around. 
and you can treat, it has, even if you treat 25 or 10% in the worst hands, 10% of patients do well with a, with a lap band, then you can actually get those 10 patients into your, into your office, into your treatment plan, and now they're in the loop. Um, the, one of the main reasons why there is such a low conversion rate of the morbidly obese having surgery, or maybe one, less than 1% of patients having surgery, is because they're frightened. They're frightened of having 80% of their stomach amputated. Even if we find that it's very safe, we feel we do a good job, it's great operation, the perception to patients is that I don't want something that invasive. And I think we all uh, hear that every day in our patient population. So I'm a firm believer of, of the incremental, but I think gastric band should be the first. And then you can either go to a sleeve, I, much rather prefer going to gastro bypass because I think sleeve is a, just an intermediary uh, operation, but more acceptable. <laughs> just because I don't eat my own day. So <laughs> we, we did publish the data, but you only took uh, one table of the paper. Uh, the data, the, the one in figure, one table showed that the DS, or, or actually that was a DPD's congenital version, it was not a DS, in fact. Uh, was superior to gastric bypass. Now, we don't know if the, that applies to the DS, but we assume it's, uh, it might be the, the case. However, when you look at the other side, which has the side effects, even in a small study as the one we had in Rome, there was a clear, significant difference in side effects of DPD compared to gastric bypass. Therefore, when you make a choice, you have to make a choice that is always a trade-off between benefits and risks. And I think most people with these are kind of concerned about offering large-scale DPD even given the efficacy that is safe. And finally, I would say, why are you so worried about uh, failure of gastro bypass and, and, and what you would have to do next? What about doing nothing surgically? I think there are many patients who are not necessary. We, we jump on into reversing these patients. I don't think we should reverse. We have no evidence yet that at least for diabetes that there is such an advantage in terms of cost effectiveness and effectiveness in revising. So if the patient is not responding to surgery, with all the drugs that you've seen this morning being in the market, I think you still have many other options. Last comment. The, the, the problem is you're making the decision for the patient. Why don't we ask the patient what they want? Maybe the patient wants no diabetes and is willing to take the procedure that has more side effects because they don't want diabetes. They don't want to have amputation, heart attacks, kidney transplantation, uh, losing their eyesight. Why don't we ask the patient which decision they want to do? Because most often when they come in the office, we're making the decision for themselves. Last comment, please. Uh, yes, um, I think uh, revision of a gastric bypass to sleep uh, is, is an acceptable procedure and can be done in the hands of a well experienced surgeon. The thing is that for type 2 diabetes, I have never done any, any band, and I've never done a band. Never. I don't think it works. <laughs> but the idea, of, the idea of sleep first makes sense, right? But in my country, type 2 diabetes patients, 60% vitamin D deficiency, 11% iron deficiency. So you do a sleep and it failed. So what is next? Are you going to divert your duodenum in a patient who already is suffering from osteoporosis, who already is suffering from anemia? I won't. That's the reason to why you are struggling to find a way to keep the patients apart from malabsorption. Thank you very much. It was a controversial uh, topic. Uh, I thank all the experts. Uh, I think we're done with time. Thank you.